long or at the end, and we'll be available to assist you even after the program. So the initial topic I'm starting with is E2 Treaty Investor Visas and also Citizenship by Investment. And we'll get into what that's about in a moment. So an E2 Treaty is a treaty between some of the countries in the world and the United States, which includes a provision for a investment visa known as an E2 investment visa or treaty investment visa. This allows the individual to come into the US and you can be here very quickly to work in the enterprise and the spouse can get a work permit and spouse and children under 21 and unmarried can go to any school. The capital has to be substantial there's no specific bright line test. We recommend approximately $200,000. The individual will come to develop and direct the company and the treaty country owner must have at least a 50% ownership in the entity. And if it's a foreign entity that has the ownership in the US enterprise, that entity must be at least 50% owned by a treaty country nationals who are not green card holders, US citizens, or uh, have any other kind of visa other than an E2 for this particular enterprise. The operation has to be real and operating. It can't be a, a plan in the future with some money in the bank that will not fly. It cannot be a marginal enterprise, which means that it has to be able to generate sufficient income more than the living income for the investor and family. Also, the individual has to intend to depart the US at the end of the E2 visa, which is a much lesser standard than having a residence abroad to which you, you do not intend to abandon, as in the B1, B2, or the F1 and similar visas. Next slide, please. The list is long as to which countries qualify under the E2, and this is the summary. Um, the main countries we will be talking about are Grenada, Taiwan, and Turkey. Taiwan is because it already has a treaty and anyone who holds Taiwan nationality can apply for an E2. Grenada and Turkey offer a citizenship by investment, CBI. That means for a relatively small amount of money in relation to some of the other countries that want millions of dollars, you can obtain in a relatively quick time, like six months or so, full citizenship of either of those two countries. The advantage is that both countries have E2 treaties with the United States. So you can get, for example, a Chinese national who now holds Canadian citizenship going into the US consul in Guangzhou and picking up an E2 visa as a Grenadian resident, uh, citizen, excuse me. Next page, please. Next slide. Okay. Um, I mentioned the same nationality um, so that any other employees of the company that want an E2 visa must be of the same country. The employer must be executive or super, supervisory or must have essential skills needed for the company. Some people believe that you have to have one year overseas in a company in the company or the group of companies to get the E2 that is not correct you can go straight into your E2 enterprise as long as you are qualified to run an enterprise the L1 has the one year requirement of employment and we'll get onto that a little later next slide please visa stamps put into the passport by a consul can be up to two up to five years it's a discretionary but usually up to five years this is different from the authorized stay when you arrive to be admitted to the us in an e2 status you will be given a two-year stay now provided your visa stamp in the passport is valid when you enter each time you arrive you will get two years if however the visa stamp expires you have two choices you can either to adjustment of status, uh, sorry, a change of, uh, excuse me, one more time. You can do an extension of your E2 in the US, or you can go out of the country, visit the US consul, 
and file a new application for an E2. This will assume that you didn't initially get your E2 from a US consul. So the, the visa itself cannot lead directly to a green card, but if you qualify under other categories like the Intercompany Transfer Executive Manager, you could well get your green card even if you are in an E2 status. Next slide, please. Initially, you had to have physical offices and you had to show your ability to enter those offices and work there. Just recently, the State Department through the U for the US consuls came up with the acceptance of a virtual office. So if you're in R&D or something that's high technology and you can work virtually, then you can still get your E2 visa. Next slide, please. The E2 is not subject to the proclamations, but there will be a long wait unless you will qualify for an expedited visa interview. We've been successful in getting expedited interviews and um, very helpful to our clients. We'll come on to more of that when we do with the proclamations. So in April 2020, we successfully obtained an emergency appointment for an E2 applicant in three days. As soon as they had their interview, a few days later, they had their visa stamp and they were able to enter the US. So here is a letter from the consul confirming. Moving on to L1. Um, Evelyn, are you doing L1 or me? Yes. Go ahead, please. Evelyn, All yes. right, next slide, please. All right, so I'll be covering L1 and EB1C green card. What is L1 visa? L1 is a temporary work visa. It's not a green card, it's a temporary work visa, um, and which enables the US employers to transfer an executive or manager employees from their foreign company to its new or existing parent, subsidiary, or affiliate company in the US to work in the same or similar managerial or executive capacity. Here, the L1A employee must have had at least one continuous year of physical employment within the last three years before the application of an application for admission into the U.S. is submitted. Um, uh, is submitted. So, you know, unlike E2, which did not require does not require one year of foreign employment, L1 does require at least one year, one continuous year of physical employment with the foreign company before they come to the US to work in that executive or managerial position. Any day spent in the US, even if work related, you know, just short trip, business trip, do not count toward the one year of continuous employment um, because the physical presence is the key. They have to have one year of physical presence, even though it does not break that continuous employment, just a you know, temporary business trip. The only difference, so that is L1, the temporary L1 visa. There is an option called EB1C green card. Um, it is a very easy and straightforward path from temporary L1 visa, work visa, to EB1C green card because all the requirements, number one, two, three, four, are same, exactly the same, identical, except for one. In order for the company to sponsor for the EB1C green card, all of the above have to be, all of the above has to be met, plus number one, the U.S. company has to be existed for at least one year. Therefore, they have to have tax return. And number two, must have financial ability to pay the EB1C employees' proffered green card salary. There's no minimum amount, but usually the executive salary ranges between $80,000 to $120,000. So um, next slide, please. And um, the immigration agency officers use a different definition of manager or executive. It, we used, it used to be that we were able to um, utilize both definitions in one application for, for one um, beneficiary employee because, you know, sometimes you can be the manager, sometimes you can be an executive. As you can see, if you read the definitions, some, sometimes, you know, some of the uh, job duties can be overlapped. However, recently, USCIS pointed out that it can't be both and we have to choose one. So we now have to 
you know, really make sure um, to review carefully and make sure to choose one. So you can take a look at the definitions um, in your spare, spare time. Next, next slide, please. Evelyn, real quick, just wanted yeah. to break it up with a question or two here. Sure. Um, so we, we have a couple question in line. Is there an upside to using your law office services instead of using a qualified law office in my country? Oh, in terms of immigration firm? Exactly. Uh, so qualified U.S. immigration firm in the foreign country versus U.S. immigration firm in the physically located in the U.S.? Exactly. What, what it seems like from the question, uh, how I understand it, 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 that's the case. Yeah. So a lot of people ask me the same questions. You know, there are a lot of U.S. immigration attorneys work in foreign countries because of the, you know, time zone, convenience. You know, a lot of people actually, you know, prefer to work with somebody who's close to them. However, um, you know, as a U.S. immigration attorneys practicing in the U.S., we get a lot of benefits because we have very close um, connected community, immigration in, um, attorneys community. And we share ideas and we do seminars, we have conferences. Right now we can't have in-person conference, but we do have virtual conferences. So we share, constantly share ideas, we help, help one another. Therefore, we um, tend to have much more uh, in-depth knowledge of immigration and also recent trends in a faster way. So in that sense, we are able to sort of, you know, help our clients uh, in a much better way. Makes sense. And for anyone that's looking to evaluate an immigration attorney, it's good to understand, you know, the number of cases that they're handling, what their approval rate is, and, you know, explore online their, their profiles. Um, can I apply for an E2 visa for my country of residence instead of from my own country? The answer to that question is yes, you can. Perfect. All right, let's go back to the uh, the presentation. All right, let's, next slide, please. Okay, so there's a difference between new office L1A and existing L1A, meaning if the foreign company wants to set up a new startup company in the US. So difference between the new office or startup L1A company and the existing company is that L1A employee will only get one year of authorized stay for the first year, which means, and then, uh, which means that it has has to be then be extended in increments of two years um, until seven years. You get seven year maximum L1 visa, but it has to be extended in increments of two years after one year. While the existing company's L1 employees can obtain first three year visa, I mean three year authorized stay, and they and and they can extend in the increments of two years up to seven years. For an L1, um, unlike E2, the company must secure uh, sufficient physical premises, including the office space and the warehouse, if applicable, even before first L1A employee can obtain his L1A visa. So unlike E2, with the recent update in the, um, in the FAM, uh, where virtual office can even be considered for L1, the physical, the sufficient physical sp uh, premises space has to be secured. So for example, let's say you want to hire up to seven employees um, by year, you know, at, by the end of year one, then that means you have to secure sufficient physical space to be able to house and, you know, put all the employees, including seven, eight employees in the office. If you have one tiny little office where you can only fit in one desk and your business plan says we're going to hire up to seven, eight employees by year end, year one, then it might not work. They may question you, okay, how are you going to support your business within one year when you only have one tiny little office with one desk? And while there's no required minimum amount of initial capital to be invested into the US company, we suggest that it is at least about 250K or more to begin with, um, but it, it, it's really up to uh, what makes uh, the most business sense. Um, if the if the business can start the business uh, if the company can start a business with uh, you know 150 or 300k um, and can gradually start expanding uh, and to hire up to seven eight employees by year one then it might work. Um, in terms of hiring hiring and num hiring the number of employees to be hired, um, there's no magic number which will be which will guarantee the approval. But we usually say that the chance of getting an approval. Uh, for the startup company L1, um, 
I would say eight to 10 employees by year one would be very conservative. Um, and I know it is very aggressive number and it is not really easy to hire eight to 10 employees by year one for the startup companies in the US, even if the US company doesn't need a visa. But you know that's a conservative, uh, very conservative number. But even with you know three to four or five employees by year one, it can still be possible. So it is really case by case. So if you have any questions, please let us know. A lot of um, people think that misconception that a lot of people tell me and ask me is that they think that the foreign companies L1 business and US companies L1 business have to be the same, same type of business. I mean, that's a common sense, right? And it's really natural to think like that. However, that's not true. The company in the foreign country, which engages in, for example, trucking or um, trading business, can actually open up a new company or acquire an existing company in the US in different type of business, such as franchise restaurant business or real estate investment business. The key point here is that we look at the person, the executive or manager who's being transferred from the foreign country to the US and the relationship between the two entities um, and whether it makes sense to justify the need for the executive or manager. Um, you know, we don't really, you know, the nature and type of business of the two companies is really not the point. Of course, it, it is much easier to explain the relationship if the two companies engages in the same type of business, but it's not a requirement. And also, it is possible that the foreign company um, first acquires an existing business in the U.S. that engages in a completely different business like franchise uh, while they do something different in foreign country. And then gradually, you know, expand its own and, and establish its own line of business in addition to the franchise business as part of its expansion. So it is really important to note that L1A uh, is not for, um, you know, uh, just mom and pop store, but for a mid-sized or large size company with sufficient staffing and business operations that require an intra-company transfer executive or manager. Next slide, please. So um, just quickly, uh, unlike E2, which can be applied to the U.S. consulate directly, L1A petition must be filed with U.S. immigration agency first, called USCIS first, and then the approval will be transferred over to the consulates in your country for visa processing. Like I said, um, start a company first one year and then up to seven years in increments of two years. Um, if, it exists, if it's existing, then first three years and up to seven years. And then um, the spouse can obtain L2 visa and they can work. Um, and also their spouse and minor children under 21 can um, also obtain L1 and attend school. Um, here, the key difference between E2 and L1 is that for L1, dual intention is allowed. Meaning you can even have at the time of applying and entering the US with your L1 visa, you can, it is perfectly fine to have um, intention to immigrate. Um, in the immediate future. That means, you know, non-immigrant and immigrant intention at the same time. So dual intention is allowed. And that's why L1A, even though it is a little bit, is, you know, relatively harder to get compared to E2, um, you know, uh, once you get the L1, there's a lot of benefits that you can enjoy. Next slide, please. So, um, like I said, L1A is has been very challenging, especially in the current climate. Um, we've been seeing more and more very highly complicated requests for evidence. Once the case is submitted with USCIS, then it, and if the USCIS officer is not fully satisfied with the initial petition, then they can issue something called request for evidence or RFE, requesting for the additional information or evidentiary documents so that they can confirm that they meet the qualifications and requirements. So we've been seeing a lot of um, very highly complicated and difficult RFEs. And, um, you know, we do have a lot of different scenarios and, you know, we do have our own strategies to overcome those RFE issues. So if you have any questions about the RFE, recent LNA RFEs, please let us know. Next slide, please. So real quick, we, we've had a lot of questions come in. I just okay. wanted to go through a, a few of them. Um, one. One of the questions related to the E2 for Bangladesh. Bangladesh is only three months. So, you know, essentially it's a single entry, then you have to renew it. Um, I don't know if you want to give more commentary in terms of the, the what that means, three months versus five years, David Rabbit. 
Well, the three months is uh, through a reciprocal agreement with the United States. In other words, Bangladesh will only give U.S. people the three months. So you have to renew it every three months if you travel. However, remember what I said earlier, you get two years admission upon arrival, so you can stay for two years. And if you don't leave the country, before the two years are up, you'll file for an extension and you'll get another two years. And this can go on and on. But the minute you leave the country, uh, you will have to get a new visa stamp as your passport. Okay, another question. You two have been talking a lot about visas, applying for visas based on a business. What status are you on when you're looking at businesses and when you're exploring and when you're setting up? What, what status would, would, would someone be on? Well, I'd start with a B1 or some other visa where the people have been in the country before you file in the US for at least 90 days. Also for an E2, if you pick up your Grenadian or Turkish citizenship while you're in the US, you need to enter the US in that new citizenship to get a change to an E2. Uh, Evelyn, you got anything? Yeah, and then also if you're from the countries that allow you to travel without the visa, such as ESTA, then another option is to travel in ESTA using your ESTA um, to enter the US to look for a business. So with ESTA and B1 uh, business visitors visa, there's a limited activities that you're allowed to do. Even though you are not authorized to work in the US, there's a limited business activities that ESTA and B1 visitor uh, business visitors visa allow you to do, such as signing the contract, lease, lease agreement, you know, doing the presentations or attending the seminars. So there are certain limited business activities that you're able to engage in. Um, that's how you are able to get involved and find the find and look for business and sign necessary contracts. But just very quickly, Esther is a visa waiver program limited Here. to ninety days in the US. Go ahead. Sorry, David. David, go ahead. Sure. Uh, Esther is a limited visa. It's a visa waiver program. When you enter the country, you're only allowed to stay up to 90 days and you cannot change that status. So you will still have to go home to pick up your L or your E, whatever business you've organized. Thank you. And Wadir has a question. L1 employees, do they need to be hired full-time or is part-time sufficient? For the L1, um, we usually prefer to see uh, full-time um, L1 because they're the executive or and you know, um, executive or a managerial employee, but technically they can even, it, it's an intra-company transfer visa. So they can travel all over the world to participate and engage in any kind of business activities that uh, require um, their presence, physical presence, meaning, you know, any kind of um, global offices that are affiliated with their um, headquarter office in their home country. So technically they don't really have to physically spend always spend time in the US as a full-time. However, we usually prefer to see a full-time um, employment for the US company, but it's not a requirement. One last question and then we'll go to the, the presentation, but it's irrelevant. David was talking about ESTA. What is ESTA? ESTA is a visa waiver program, again, with certain countries, and you apply online for your visa to enter the U.S. Once you've got that confirmed uh, allowance, I think it lasts for two years, you can just show up at the U.S. and uh, confirm that you are an ESTA-approved person, and they let you in for 90 days. This sort of, uh, obviates the need to go to the U.S. consul and pick up a visa, but it has its 90-day limitation. Yeah, um, just, just quickly, ESTA stands for Electronic System for Travel Authorization. And it is only available and applicable if your country, um, you know, is uh, qualified with the agreements with the U.S. Okay. All right, uh, let's move on. Patrick, can I move on? For sure. Okay. All right, so um, we're, just, we're just gonna, in, in the interest of time, we're gonna quickly go over the proclamations. I'm sure you guys all know about this presidential, Trump presidential proclamations. Um, 
you know, with respect to travel ban. So um, initially it was uh, 10014, which suspends entry of certain immigrants without a valid immigrant visas or travel documents for 60 days. Um, the next proclamation, 10052, which was uh, which became effective June 22nd, 2020, extended 10014, the previous proclamations. So for the first one, 10014 did not really apply to um, work-related business visa and you know EB-5 investment visas was, were also excluded. However, the second one, 10052, um, uh, now applies to H-1Bs, H-2Bs, uh, and their dependents, as well as L-1A and L-1B and their dependents and certain J-1 visas. So since L-1 um, companies are impacted, uh, impacted by the 10052, a lot, we got a, we we started to receive a lot of phone calls from our potential clients and existing clients panicking. However, there's an exception. So any companies um, that does, that engages in business that are essential to the U.S. food supply chain, um, or um, if the L1A employees entry um, can be considered uh, uh, in a national interest, then there's a way to obtain visa. Next slide, please. So in August 2020, not only were we able to successfully obtain initial L1A approval with USCIS, when it was transferred over to the consulate, when currently consulate is no consulates are um, processing any L1 visa uh, because of this proclamation. However, we made an argument uh, regarding the national interest exception um, argument, and we were able to obtain expedited L1 approval within one day, one business day. Next slide, please. So I um, heard one c So next slide, please. So this is the comparison chart that I that we prepared to compare E2 and L1 visa. In the interest of time, we're not going to be able to go over one by one. But please take a look at it, and if you have any questions, please let us know. Next slide, please. Okay, EB5. That's the what we used to call the million dollar investment visa. In November of last year, the $500,000 lowest investment amount was increased to $900,000, and the standard investment amount of $1 million was increased to $1.8 million. So those numbers came in as a higher investment requirement. Going forward, the areas that are regarded as targeted employment areas to allow you to have the lower amount of investment uh, was more rigorously and strictly defined, and immigration will make an adjudication on that when they deal with the case itself. Um, also with this um, regulation in November, if you have to change projects, you can retain your priority date of an approved I-526, that's the first stage of EB-5. And then um, each derivative, der each derivative person, that's the family, can file their own petition regarding removal of conditions. And the most important part of any EB-5 is tracing with extreme accuracy and detail the lawful source and separately the lawful path of the funds being invested. Next slide, please. The timeline is approximately 37 months for an I-526, that's stage one. Uh, you then get your two years of conditional residence, and then the I-29 to, to remove conditions ranges from 28 to 51 months. Uh, the total average for getting visas where the visas are current is six to eight years. However, if you're from China or Vietnam, it can bump up beyond 14 years. We have found that immigration have been very slow in addressing their, uh, their cases, so we have filed on behalf of many clients recently what's called a writ of mandamus, which is a request to the federal court to tell immigration to adjudicate the case. It doesn't allow you to get an approval, but it allows you to force immigration to come up with an approval, a denial, a request for evidence, but not no longer to sit on the case. The redeployment issue is when the project is completed, but you haven't finished your time, your two years, uh, how is that money going to be transferred, where it can go? There are a lot of rules in this regard. 
So it's extremely difficult to present it in, in one minute. So let's deal with that specifically on each case if they come up. Lastly, the RFEs that come in from immigration regarding capital raised um, for E2 and EB5 are just so uh, extremely intense. We've been very successful in obtaining approvals, but some of these cases they're insistent on denying. So then again, we go to federal court this time to get a decision that immigration were wrong. We've done several of those, and so far I'm happy to say we have 100% success in the federal court. Either immigration settled or we won. Next slide, please. Evelyn. Real quick, we got about five minutes uh, for David Hurston's presentation, David Hurston Partners' presentation. Uh, that being said, this segues well because I get this question every other day. I have an E2 visa, I want to get an E2 visa, how do I get a green card? Because I'd say 90, 95% of our clients, they don't actually renew the E2 visa. Them or the spouse gets a green card. So, you know, how can they get a green card? They're on the E2 visa or they're on some other non-immigrant visa. Well, if they qualify like an EB-5 and they wait it out, then the investment can be done saying the spouse's name. And when they go to the interview at the US Consul, the husband spouse or the other spouse simply doesn't go to that interview, can follow to join later if choose, if they choose, but then the one spouse plus the children under 21 unmarried can go to the US. So EB-5 is a good example of that. There are some other visas that would be simple, but each would be applicable. Each, each one has to qualify on its own merits. And this Evelyn may touch on the EB-1A, EB-2, and the EB-2 and 3 PERM. Those are uh, are also available without having to come to the US. All right, so because we don't have enough time to cover all types of you know options that they have in order to um, adjust their status from E2 to green card, I'm just gonna very quickly go over this slide, but if you have any questions at the end, please let us know, we can have a separate consultation. So there are several options for the green card. So um, it is usually categorized into one EB1, EB2, EB3, and then EB, EB4 is more for the religious um, you know, type of uh, immigrant visa, so we're gonna skip. So, and then EB5, investment visa, which David just covered. So EB1A is um, for, for those with extraordinary ability in their field, such as science, engineering, or business, um, you know, or arts, and their work and achievements are nationally or internationally recognized you know, on the news or publications, or they have great patent, patent, patented technologies filed under their names, then um, they may be able to apply for the green card um, without having a green card sponsor. Same for a national interest waiver. Um, for that reason, uh, because their skills and um, exceptional uh, ability uh, are considered a national considered be, considered to be in a national interest, they don't need a sponsor. Uh, however, the most typical green card option that they have is EB2 or EB3, um, perm-based green card. This one, they have to find a sponsoring company who will you know, go through the testing the labor market and sponsor for their green card. Testing the labor market, meaning they have to make sure that you know, they test the labor market to ensure that there's no willing, able, and qualified US workers before they are able to hire these foreign national workers. E2 investors are not able to sponsor for themselves using their E2 entity because of self-interest, right? However, the spouse can, after obtaining the work permit, can go elsewhere, uh, look for a potential sponsoring company who can potentially sponsor for their green card, and then the E2 investor can obtain green card through their spouse's um, green card sponsorship as a derivative, derivative spouse. And there are other, several other non-immigrant visa options, such as F1, M1, um, M1 student visa, H1B uh, for specialty occupation, J1, um, O1s. So uh, if you have any questions, please let us know. Next slide, please. Uh, we're not gonna be able to go over this slide, but there are a lot of um, COVID-19 related updates and um, travel ban. There are specific countries that are still subject to travel, 14 days of um, travel restrictions. So if you have any questions, um, oh, and then uh, there's a closure between Canada, US, and Mexico, US borders. 
Uh, it, is, it has been extended until September 21st, 2020. And then I just saw the news today, this morning, that Canada is considering to extend it until October 21st. For Mexico, I haven't seen any news, but I think it is in my opinion that they will also likely extend it until um, October. But if you have any questions related to COVID-19 travel restrictions um, or any other questions uh, related to the topics that we cover, please feel free to contact us separately. Thank you. Just, and, let, me just, um, uh, let me just close very quickly. Um, times are different in immigration law. There are problems, but you can turn every problem into an opportunity, which is what we do. We're getting cases coming in still, investors are being, investments are being made, and visas are being approved. So notwithstanding what you see and hear, just know that we can get things done for you, and we will do the best we can when we get it. It's not a closed shop. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's key. And for everyone to know, you know, they've processed many thousand visas over the last few years. Their approval rates around 99%. The final approval rate for our clients with them is 100%. So they've been a great um, advisor for our clients. Uh, we're gonna, we'll keep Evelyn and David on, we'll, we'll hide their screens and I'll go through uh, my, my presentation at this time. Um, so let me just pull this up. So changing a little bit of the focus. Again, my name is Patrick Fendaro of Visa Franchise. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about franchise and business options that are available for foreign national uh, investors. Can everyone see my screen? All right. So quickly, who is Visa Franchise? Three options to support your business search analysis, as well as factors to consider when analyzing industries and businesses. And then I'll talk about a couple E2 visa case studies. Uh, we've had hundreds of clients over the years, but we'll just go through two of them uh, and then go through some real franchise examples available on our online portal. So visa franchise based in Miami. Uh, we have staff across the world, uh, speak over six languages, uh, including Spanish, Portuguese, French, uh, Chinese, uh, our, our team is based uh, in Miami. Our experience is working in the financial markets. I started my career working at JP Morgan. I worked at a fund that would lend money to franchisees. And then my brother and business partner, Jack, he worked for the parent company of Burger King, Restaurant Brands International that also owns Tim Hortons, Popeyes, and, and Burger King, of course. So this is what we do. We understand the franchise space and the small business investment space quite well. And we've done solely that for the last five years. We support our clients principally in three different ways. We help owner operators find and analyze franchise opportunities. We've looked at over 2,900. Right now we're going through every 2020 franchise disclosure document available and going through the, the key items of it. Many of these documents are over 200 pages long. We'll go through and, and vet it out. I'll, I'll talk uh, on another slide on the type of things that we look out for in franchises. But generally, these clients are going to work full time. They invest between 100 and 300,000. Um, if it's an investment above 200,000 for the E2, it's generally a very straightforward process. We've had approvals as low as 80,000, but they've, they've been difficult and, and it's, it's a bit more of a strain for everyone involved. Uh, to get the, the visa approved. Um, and for these, advanced English is required, and they need to have a liquid capital of over 150,000 to be a client of a visa franchise. We also have more high net worth clients that need operational support. They have businesses abroad. They Not only do we vet the, the business model, the franchise, but we also vet the operator. Generally, the operator is gonna be the uh, franchisor themselves, which you could enter into a management contract or take a minority stake in the business to help with some of the day-to-day -day operations. Those type of clients generally invest between 200 and 350,000 uh, for the E2 uh, investor treaty uh, visa. And then we have the self-guided search. We have a lot of clients, uh, they don't wanna engage our services, they wanna do the search themselves, they wanna get in direct contact with the franchisors or the businesses for sale. We don't wanna hold you back. 
Uh, we're publishing a lot of our findings and the key research on our, our portal Vetted Biz. Uh, currently, there's over 1,700 franchises. We just have 30 businesses for sale now. We expect 3,000 by the end of the year. And our analysts here in Miami over the last nine months have gone through 1.3 million SBA loans uh, to see the failure rate across different industries, if a franchise makes sense in certain industries versus a non-franchise business. So I encourage you to check out our website, www.vettedbiz.com. Uh, 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 um, moving right along, factors to consider. We like fast food, but principally fast food options that are healthy fast food. Also concepts could be burgers, pizza, where they're mostly doing takeout and delivery and their model is optimized for takeout and delivery. Real estate property management, healthcare, cleaning, pet, uh, adoption rates have gone up 30% plus here in Miami. We've seen similar uh, adoption rates go up across the whole United States. So pet care is a booming industry. It has been for some time. Uh, business services, so insurance, taxes, nothing sexy, but it makes good stable uh, income and pretty high profit margins. Uh, beauty, uh, as well as education, and, and especially on the school reinforcement side, uh, a lot of a lot of parents are, are getting their kids are getting fatigued with the online learning, and they still want to have that want that that interaction uh, with a tutor uh, in in the school districts that um, they're not going back uh, fully to school. So key factors for small business success: uh, looking at the the profitability, looking at the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow making sure that has recurring revenue and or high margins. Uh, so talking about, for example, a landscaping business, you have the same clients that are paying you every month. You heard that you have that recurring revenue. High margin could look at a barber shop where the barber keeps say 50 per, 50% and uh, the house, the franchisee keeps 50% uh, of every sale. And you could only, you could have one full-time employee and the rest are 10 and nine contractors. So it's a very high margin type business. Um, Management team, who's behind the franchisor? Uh, if you have operational support, who's going to be the one uh, leading the day-to-day? -day? Industry and brand and growth, and then strong liquidity, especially in the times of COVID. So there's opportunities to buy an existing business. So it's important to look at um, how, how much they've had to keep as working capital in these times and how much they have uh, on their balance sheet. And then also talking to, if it's a new franchise, talking to franchisees, understand how much working capital they need especially in the beginning, the first month, two months, three months, uh, to make sure that the, the business passes that break-even point. Ghost kitchen. So this is a hot area right now. In the UK, it's called dark kitchen, um, and it's essentially just takeout and delivery. So you, there are a couple of benefits, lower overhead costs, reduced rent, uh, increased speed to market. You can deliver on a lot of different platforms, um, and it's – Essentially, you can open up a business for a fraction of the cost, usually one third of the cost it would be to open up a, a similar restaurant concept in a traditional space. Visa franchise, what we're doing on the analysis side. So for all the clients that engage us, those owner operators, as well as with the more high net worth individuals that are seeking operational support, we pre-screen all the businesses. So we've looked through thousands of franchise disclosure documents, uh, I'd say at least 5,000 uh, over the past five years. Uh, and we know what to look out for and we know what red flags to raise. Looking at litigation, prior, prior bankruptcies of the principals uh, of, the, of the parent company of the franchise, analysis on the management team. Uh, we look at uh, also the past three years income statements and balance sheets. This is all available. You just have to know where to look and have to know the right questions to ask. We do, and we, we're filtering out these businesses um, to make sure that uh, what you see is already pre-filtered. You still have to do your work, and you have to talk to franchisees, talk to the franchisor, uh, sync with your accountant, but we're going to take pre-screen a lot of the, the, the options for you. Generally, we're talking to a handful of franchisees to see their satisfaction as well as consumers to see how happy they are uh, with the services provided by that franchise system.
Then clients engage us for a custom extensive study. We do a SWOT analysis, best practices, uh, business evaluation metric. And we have that white glove service. So we, we speak six different languages. Generally, you speak the same the language as the client. We're with you every step of the way. And we're with you most closely until you decide to invest in the business. And then largely our work is done. But we want to make sure that your visa is approved uh, and you have a, a smooth transition to the United States uh, with you and your family. Quickly on E2 visa case studies. So one, first one, real estate property management. We've had at least 20 clients invest in real estate property management over the past few years. This case is for a client that invested back in 2017. He's built out a portfolio of over 200 units across LA County. It wasn't easy though in the beginning, I have to say, be, be very direct. He invested 110K, including working capital. First year he worked a lot though, but he, he was able to um, bear fruit in terms of getting 200 properties under management for that franchise system, the, the median um, per property is 2,200, but you look at LA County and you can assume it's gonna be a lot more than the median. Um, so he has a very stable business. His return's been 100% plus. Uh, if you take out the first year uh, where it was, you know, breaking even, a little above break even, and then after that, uh, it's been a very successful business where he invested 110K. Right now, those type of businesses are trading at one time revenue. So if you have a business that has 600K of revenue in the property management space, you could probably sell it for 500K, 600K. That very same business that you started for 100,000, 110,000. So keep that in mind. Um, there are excellent opportunities for existing businesses for sale, especially in light of, of the current uh, crisis of COVID. Um, and there's also times that you could do a hybrid approach where you buy an existing portfolio of properties under management. With your attorney, you negotiate the contract with the seller to keep them on as a manager. And maybe there's some seller financing and you make sure that those contracts are sticky. The second example does quite exactly that where they're buying a, an existing portfolio of landscaping routes, principally in Florida, and then they're buying more equipment, they're hiring more, more staff, and they're expanding and upselling that book of clients. Um, and for this client, they invested 225,000, uh, ownership of 51% of the business. Uh, the licensor owns a 49% non-controlling stake. It's important you have a controlling uh, managerial stake in the business uh, for all our clients. And for them, the job count was quite low in terms of three W-2 employees and then five uh, contractors. And that estimated return is a lot substantially less, right around 10% annually. Uh, but our, our client's not working. He's not putting in the hours like this one, um, putting it working uh, 45 hours a week, substantially less. Um, he's more on the strategy side and, and the financing of finances of, of the business. Um, real quick, I just wanted to show a, a quick video testimonial of one of our clients that invested in a service uh, franchise. Um, and I'll show this video. So hang tight. And in the comment box, let me know if you can't hear the audio well. All right, so I just heard that there was no sound. I'll send a link to the video for you all to, um, you can listen to uh, after today's live stream. 
uh, quickly just wanted to go through our, our platform um, that it is. Okay. So this is a self-guided platform. So Visa Franchise is an advisory service where you engage our services to do that custom study. We also have the option where you can browse for franchises yourself on our site. So looking at say food and beverage and you put in the investment amount. So you can see a lot of the options available here. Um, going to the going to the data that we have on the SBA side, um, we've reviewed, I think it's 400,000 SBA loans over the last 10 years. I mentioned 1.3 million, that's over the last 30 years. But you can see the success rate of the loans issued from 2010. Um, and then you can compare that for non-franchises to franchise businesses. Um, so for franchise businesses, for food and beverage, it was a little better. Um, the charge off rate compared to the paid in full rate on the loans uh, was better for franchise businesses in the food and beverage space. Uh, to, so to put that in simpler terms, nine people paid off their loan. They took, off, they took a loan to open up a food and beverage business. Nine people took a loan. One person couldn't pay it back. Um, the rate is going to go lower uh, as you have a higher sample study, but this is the freshest data that we've calculated looking back over the last uh, 10 years. And then when you really drill down on a franchise by franchise basis, um, it, the, um, the, you can really determine who, who the winners are and who the, who the losers are in the franchise space looking at the, the loan success rate. Um, real quick, Estrella Insurance, we have three clients right now going through the process applying for the E2 visa with them. Um, it's an insurance business. It's been around 40 years. Um, so it's it's proven concept based here in South Florida as well. Um, they have a team that speaks English and Spanish. We have some clients that really speak uh, minimal English that are investing with them as they have capabilities to serve Spanish-speaking franchisees. They're operating across the United States uh, with fantastic opportunities available in Texas, California, and outside of Miami-Dade County. Um, and we encourage you to spend some time looking on our site. Uh, another concept, Rush Bowls uh, in the healthy fast food space. Uh, they've really uh, implemented over the years a grab and go, uh, which in COVID times has been really, really good um, in terms of sanitation and just having the consumer be more comfortable uh, with entering the, uh, the space. All right. So just went through the franchise examples. Right now, I'd like to go through some questions. So I'll kick it off. Um, I'll go through some of these questions in terms of that are more franchise related. And then I'll turn it over to Evelyn and David to talk about the ones that are more, um, more immigration related. Um, so one from Sherry, in addition to your vetted business, do you offer opening of new business? If yes, what does it cost and will it help in immigration? So new startup businesses, um, we don't advise with. We're actually doing a webinar with Journey Business Plans, which our firm together with David Hurston Partners has worked extensively with. They've done business plans on over 80 franchises and they've helped hundreds of our clients to date. They specialize in that. So if you have an idea, concept that you wanna open up your own business, do a um, market research to understand vendors, we don't do that at Visa Franchise. It's not our specialty, but Journey is the expert. You can bring them in and they can help you uh, to start up a, a business and then work with Evelyn and David on the immigration side. So great question. We don't help with that. If you're interested, join our, our webinar next week with Journey. They'll be talking about startups and, and how they help uh, people with startups on that side. 
Um, let's see. Hey, Nick, uh, is there any opportunity to borrow money through SBA loans, et cetera, for someone buying a business for an E2 visa? If you're buying a business, you're probably going to look at the 7A loan program. And unfortunately, you would have already had to be a green card holder or um, U.S. Uh, citizen to be applicable for the 7A SBA loan program. There's some other SBA loans like the PPP program that some E2 investor uh, investors have received PPP funding. However, for buying a business that you didn't already, already own, uh, you would need to have a, a green card or maybe you could look at partnering uh, with an American um, either green card holder or uh, US, uh, US, uh, U.S. citizen. All right. Is there any real estate from Val Valeria? Is there any uh, real estate investment that can be considered for an E2 visa? So I, I can comment. I'll, I'll kick this off from our side from a business standpoint. We've had a lot of clients invest in real estate related businesses for their E2 visa. We've had real estate property management. We've had clients that manage homeowner associations, residential property management, both long term as well as uh, shorter term, um, and then done commercial vacation rentals. We've had clients that also entered the um, refurbishing space. Uh, so there's some great uh, franchises in the kitchen and bath space. Uh, a lot of people are spending money on their homes. Americans spend a ton of money um, on outfitting offices, especially in times of, of COVID. And just a stat for you, that average American, when they're going to um, refurbish their, their kitchen, do a kitchen remodeling, they think they're going to spend $20,000. And the average American ends up spending $40,000 when they're remodeling their kitchen. So there is a, a good, there are great real estate related um, businesses that we work with, but a pure real estate investment, we, we've had some clients that actually got denied where they had five properties under management, flipping homes, and then they had to come to us to apply under a more traditional business model for their YouTube visa. But I don't, I don't want to, don't hear it from me. Let, let's, let's hear what the, both the attorneys have to say on that. Michael, um, the E2 will not allow a passive investment. That's really the crux of it. So if you're in real estate development on a full basis, a development company will work. If you're building residences and you have a slew of residences, you're going to build one after the other, that could work. I had somebody who had five 20 million plus buildings each, and that worked. He was just managing those buildings. So. Uh, Patrick answered very, very well, and that is the position. Thank you. And also one of my clients, um, my E2 clients um, from Mexico, um, she actually owns four or five different properties, but uh, it was before things became very difficult and challenging. Um, she already got the visa to, you know, housing rental business. However, um, you know, I highly recommend it that she also acquires a different type of business too, um, like such as restaurant business, in addition to the rental, uh, you know, um, housing business as to just to stay, just to be safe and be able to maintain her status. So in this current climate, I wouldn't recommend, just like Patrick said, I wouldn't recommend focusing only on, you know, purchasing properties and doing rental business. And another another uh, question from Galea: If you stay in the U.S. for several years with an E-2 visa, can you apply for residency? No, um, unless you qualify under one of the other categories, or as Evelyn in, indicated, if you have a spouse who qualifies, you cannot directly get an, a um, residency permit or green card from an E-2 directly. You can keep it going for almost forever. It's as close to a green card as you'll get, but you cannot convert it. Thank you. Patrick, we're ready for the next question. Sure. Is Pakistan part of ESTA?
and then yeah. so we can research it. No yeah, we can quickly research it. And then Sherry had another question in terms of um, E2. Basically, maybe Sherry, you could write on the chat. Um, and I'm happy to also pop on the screen comparing the um, E2 and L1 visas. Uh, there have been a couple of questions, you know, asking what what's the difference between those two. Maybe Evelyn or David could just uh, clarify quickly, and we have this uh, chart up. Well, from a practical standpoint, we need to look at each person's individual situation. Many cases uh, um, qualify for both. We then look at things like timing, how the U.S. government is treating certain categories, whether the U.S. consul will be more efficient. <clears throat> so there are a number of issues that we balance and then make that advice to the individual investor. Anna, anything to add? Oh, I agree. I just um, I was quickly searching, researching, but Pakistan is not uh, a country uh, that you know is eligible for the visa waiver program. And I agree with you, David. All right, and then we have from Federico. How much money overall is needed to get the E two on the basis of starting a franchise business, and how many employees are required? So let's uh, give that to Patrick <clears throat> based on his experience and the many ones he's done, which will give you the number of employees and the amounts, the range of the monies, and that will give you an actual real situation. Sure, okay. yeah. So what we've seen, we've had approvals as low as 80,000, but we've also had a couple of denials, around 80, 100,000, and then the client had to go back in showing that they invested more money, they, they bought a car for the business, they invested in Google Ads to get to a higher investment threshold. So I'd say you're kind of rolling the dice if you're investing less than 150K or less than 120K, uh, but it really depends on the business. And also if the business is near operational or is already operational and you have, you've already hired an employee, it's real, you know, you're selling this at the end of the day to a consulate officer and I had one client that got denied three years ago, and then he went back in um, with supporting documents three weeks later with the franchise disclosure document showing the actual sales and profit and loss of other franchisees. Because the consulate officer didn't believe for 90000 you could make that much money. He, he thought it was, there was no way that could happen. So. He showed him a, a document regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, a franchise disclosure document, and that got him approved. So I'd say on the lower investment side and with less employees, uh, it's a little more difficult, but it's definitely possible. There's another test that is applied, and <clears throat> that's under the substantial investment. And that is, depending on the ratio of the money you're putting in versus what amount may be over and owing, when you put in 100% of the money needed, you're more likely to get an approval of a low amount. But if that amount is only worth 50% of the cost of the business with a low amount, you will not get an approval. This changes if you're going into a $100 million business and you put in 5 million, which is only 5%, by virtue of its substantially, substantiality on its face, that one would be approved. No bright line tests. But remember that 50% owner of the E2 um, enterprise have to be owned by um, shareholders from the E2 treaty country. We got another question from Federico. Can the E2 visa get started while in the U.S. with a B1, B2 visa for six months? The answer is yes, if you wait for filing for 90 days. Otherwise, you could be deemed to have committed a visa fraud on entry that you really intended to go into business and work rather than you intended to either come on vacation and go to Disneyland or go to some business meetings. All right, from Fahad, we have a question. Can I purchase an existing franchise with positive cash flows under the budget of 200, 250K? From a business standpoint, for sure. Yeah, there's gonna be some great, op there are some great opportunities um, especially in, in light of the current uh, circumstances where there's some great uh, franchise resales available in that, in that range and 
I'll let Evelyn or David talk about it from an immigration standpoint. Now, the answer is probably yes. However, again, you need to look at the ratio of what amount is he putting down and how much of this amount that he is putting down less than the 200,000 is a percentage of the actual total investment. The higher the percentage, the more chance of getting the, uh, the case through. And then we have a question from Gustavo. I'll, I'll, ask, I'll answer the first part of the question. Do you have any franchise in the ground transportation space? Um, I know a lot of ground transportation companies that have gone bankrupt, uh, given Uber, and, uh, Lyft, and other car sh uh, sharing services. I would not recommend you going into that sector right now. There might be some franchises in the space. I could look into it for you. Uh, but I, you know, I had a, a client that was thinking about the E2 visa uh, that he was an employee on an L1 visa for a very large ground transportation company that was laying off a lot of their employees. So I would not recommend going in the ground transportation space right now, uh, especially as, as travels really down. Um, so, and, uh, and from a, the second question, do you recommend it to getting the visa? Well, my thought is um, if it's a single car ground transportation operation, highly unlikely you'll get an approval. But if you're taking on a fleet of cars, assuming things have got better, according to Patrick's definition, it's not good at the moment, um, there's no reason why you will not get an E. And in fact, if you have enough employees, drivers, managers, and so on, you could also get an L if you qualify from your home country side for the L in the US. Great, so we got one last question here. Thanks everyone for staying on. A lot of people um, have been on for the last 70 or so minutes since we started this live stream. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we got Norma, her last question. How long does it take for the E2 visa process to be approved? This will depend on each consulate. Uh, it takes time to prepare the case. So I assume it's going to take at least a month to put it together properly. Then, depending on the busyness of that consulate, you could get an interview in a week and you get an interview in three months. Once that interview is taken into place and you're approved, it's less than a week for them to issue your passport back to you. So I would say, I always say to people, you should be in in less than six months, but it could well be closer to three months. And um, one, one thing I wanted to add is currently, until very recently, um, most of the consulates had suspended visa processing for all E2. However, um, you know, recently, most of the consulates uh, decided to resume processing the E2 visa applications. Um, so even though there's a lot of backlog and a lot of people waiting in line. So you will probably won't be able to make an appointment, schedule the E2 visa appointments anytime soon. But um, I'm just glad to find out that most of the consulates now started to reprocessing the visa, E2 visa applications. Perfect. So just toggling the screens here. Um, I wanted to show one last time the contact information. Uh, before that, I, I just saw a, a question on the franchise side. I'll quickly answer. When choosing 120,000 franchise is likely to need another 100,000 in cash flow available beyond the investment costs. Um, 100,000 is a lot. Uh, I'd say yes and no, you need more capital, but it's more to sustain your family. So say you're investing $120,000 in a franchise, 30,000 of that more or less would be working capital, the amount of money necessary for you to make break, for, to hit the point of break even before you start taking a profit. But you should still have another 40, 50,000, ideally another 100,000 just in reserves, because maybe inside of three months to hit the break even or six months to break even, it takes a little longer. Um, so it's definitely good to have some reserves of cash, as well as if your spouse is also has, has income coming in, that, I mean, that's huge too. Um, so, you know, thanks everyone again for the time. Um, if you wanna reach out for a consultation uh, with David or Evelyn, their contact information is here. Feel free to give them a call at their office at 949-383-5358. You can visit their website at www.person.com. 
They're located in Orange County. Beautiful office, I can attest to. Um, and for us at Visa Franchise, um, we're based in Miami Beach. We have an office that we moved into right before COVID on the third floor above Lincoln Road. Um, and as anyone that's visited Miami Beach, you probably know Lincoln Road is the busy pedestrian street. Um, and feel free to shoot us an email, uh, give us a call. Uh, we're available for consultations. If you'd like more of the self-guided approach, we have that at Vetted Biz, where we publish findings on over 1,700 franchises. By the end of the year, we should have 3,000 existing businesses for sale with a lot of detailed information and great blogs. And then Visa Franchise is really more catered if you appreciate having an advisor with you every step of the way in the business buying process, franchise buying process, uh, that's the type of service for you. So we offer those two pretty distinct services. Uh, feel free to give a check on either website, enter into contact with us. And again, uh, thanks everyone for taking the time to connect. Uh, Evelyn and David, it was a pleasure having you two on. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, until next time, guys, appreciate it. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. Thank you, everyone. Okay.